It's so good to have you back, and we're super pumped that you are with us. And man, just like uh, each week, it has been spectacular. And this week is particularly special because we are here right now, like they said, at our new facility, and it's pretty crazy around here. Now, we're not even close to done, like not even close to done. We got so many things that are going on here at the church, but man, what we're excited about is where we're going, where God is taking us. And so, man, as we're going into the Take Your Steak series, man, we're pumped about, again, what God is going to put on your heart and how we're going to continue to see change. And so, uh, again, my name is Brad Livingston, and I'm the lead pastor, and it's so awesome that you're with us today. Now, what's really special uh, about what we're going into is this thought process uh, that I kind of want to talk to you about today about rest and a time to build. You see, sometimes we think activity creates opportunity and we need to be active so that we can build. But what if I told you that oftentimes the best times to build, the best times to grow, the best times to improve is actually from a rest position, not an active position. Now, it doesn't mean we're not doing anything. What it means is what if we could be both active in the world? What if we could both be active in our stance on something? What if we could be active in what we're doing uh, around us, but rested in our soul? And that's what we want to talk about, a time to build uh, and doing it with rest. So say rest. So we want to talk about rest today. Now, I'm sure all of you have found yourself in a similar place that I have. And that's when we lock into like momentary linear thinking that's all about the right now. I'm sure some of you are guilty or most of you are guilty. I know I am about thinking about the now, thinking about what's happening here, thinking about uh, not necessarily thinking about next week or next month or next year, but being locked into like, what is, what do I need to focus on today? And, and even in our planning, we're not planning uh, futuristically. We're not thinking long-term. Sometimes we can get caught up in the day-to-day mundane things that need to happen in this moment. And here's what I know. The more I get caught up in the day-to-day, the more I get caught up in the momentary, the less I'm focused on where God wants to take me. You see, sometimes it's all about getting through today, but what happens when we start focusing on getting to where God wants us to go, growing what God wants us to grow and watching what God wants to do both in our life, but also through our life. What does it look like to build something for the future? You see, I think many of us, we, maybe we've thought through, even for our kids, we've thought through maybe what we want to leave our kids. We've thought through uh, we, life insurance policies or uh, making sure that they're financially taken care of. We've thought through even maybe uh, thinking through their college fund and we're saving for that. Maybe we're thinking through uh, a car that they're going to get soon. Maybe you got a teenager and you're thinking about that 16 age frame, age time frame that's coming up and, and And uh, what we know is when we start thinking about those things, we start thinking about the future. But here's the question that I have for you. Are you thinking about the future of the next generation, your kids, your grandkids? Are you thinking about what their spiritual life will hold? Are you thinking about their well-being, not just their physical well-being, but something bigger than that? And I want to talk to you about building something today that's going to carry them long after you're gone. And so as we talk about that, man, I wanted to ask you, what is it that you're dreaming about? Not just for you, but for the kids that are coming after you. What is it that you're dreaming about that's bigger than you? What are you dreaming about that's going to last after you? And, and we see the story of David. And as David's coming up more on the tail end of his life, uh, you know, in his latter days, we see this story where he has it put on his heart that he's going to build the temple of God. So he's going to build this temple. It's going to be magnificent. Uh, We'll talk about it more uh, next week, but even the details of what he gave, the offering that he gave, the the expense, the expense. I mean, it was big. It was grand. It was amazing. And he was saying, God deserves this. We need to give this to him. But as we give this to him, man, what a place we're going to have to be able to go and meet God in a special way. And so David wants to build something great. And so we see in First Chronicles 22, in the first five verses, we see him, man, preparing. We see him talking about it. He's gathering supplies. And, and we actually, today we're gonna pick up in verse six and go through verse 10, because what I wanna tell you today is this story about how David started thinking about what life was gonna look like, not just for him, but also for his children. What, what life was gonna be like, uh, not just for his children, but the legacies that would come after that. And that's where we pick up in verse six. It says this, then he called for Solomon, his son, and charged him to build a house. Say build a house. 
for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, my son, I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord, my God. So David's saying, I had it on my heart to build it. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name. In other words, God was saying, you've shed too much blood before me on the earth. So you're not gonna be the one to do it. So God says this, he says, but the Lord, but behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of, say that word with me, rest. You say, he's gonna be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all his surrounding enemies. In other words, he's gonna have this season of rain where rest gets to surround him. The things that troubled you aren't gonna trouble him. The things that you went through, he's not gonna go through. The wars you fought, he's not gonna fight. He's gonna be resting from the enemies that are all around him. For his name shall be Solomon and I will give peace and quiet to Israel, his nation in those days. And then he says this, He shall build a house for my name. He shall be my son and I will be his father and I will establish his royal throne in Israel forever. See, what we see happening here is again, David is not gonna build the house. He says that Solomon is. In other words, what God is saying is, David, you have known me. David, you spent time in my presence. David, we have been together, but I want you to know something. We're gonna start getting ready to build something. You're gonna start gathering supplies. You're gonna start giving in a big way to something that's coming that you may not even see all of the vision. You may not even see all the fruition of it, But as you start to gather, as you start to give, as you start to be a part, know that there's something coming, even for the generations that's after you, even for Solomon, that's gonna be so big. It's gonna be a place where I dwell and it's gonna be a place where peace and quiet and mercy and rest reigns in the life of your offspring. And here's the question I have for you today. Are you ready to have a place where mercy and rest and peace gets to reign for your offspring, for your generations after you, for your children and your children? children's children. Are you ready to build a place? Because now is the time to build. Say time to build. So it's now is the time to build. So what does it look like? Well, there's kind of three steps in this process that I want to show you that comes out of First Chronicles 22 that we get to take on. We get to grab a hold of truths that get to apply to this time in your life and my life and the life of those that are going to come after us. And the first thing we have to see so we have to understand that let's prepare for the next generation to be people of rest. We need to prepare for the next generation to be people of rest rest. You see, I'm believing that Transformation Church, the next generation of Transformation Church won't have to fight for the rest, for peace, uh, for unity, because we're going to watch God transition us into that as we hand that to them. You see, I'm believing right now that God is going to take us. God is going to move us. I'm believing that God is taking us into a place where we're going to hand over a place of rest. We're gonna hand over a place of peace. We're gonna hand over a house where God's presence fills it. And we're gonna give that to the next generation. We're gonna build something now so that the people that come after us, our kids, the next generations are gonna be a people of rest. But how do we get there? We're gonna talk about that in a second. It's about taking care of what we can take care of now so they don't have to take take care of it later. You see, seasons of chaos. We're, we're preparing right now that God would transition transition us out of seasons of chaos, seasons of addictions. We're believing right now that what you struggled with and what your dad struggled with and what your dad's dad struggled with and what your dad's dad's dad struggled with, that addiction is going to be broken in Jesus' name. Like we're believing that God is going to shatter the thing that's been attached to your family for generations. We're believing that just because you're broke and just because your mom was broke and your mom's mom was broke and your mom mom's mom's mom was broke. We're breaking. We're going to see God shatter the generational poverty that is over your family. We're going to see God continue to break and tear down the things that have held on to you, have held on to your family. Just because your last name has carried something for generations doesn't mean it has to keep going after you. We're believing that God is going to create a people of rest where all the things that followed you up until now are going to be washed away. And God is giving you a brand new slate for you, for your kids, and for your kids' kids moving forward, your name will be known for something different in the future than it was known for in the past. And so we're believing that. We're believing that we're going to step out of a season of pain. 
For some of you, you've sat in pain for so long. We're gonna see God pull you out of that, out of a season of struggle. For some of you, you've just sat in struggle after struggle after struggle. We're believing that God is gonna break that down. We're believing that God is gonna take you out of the season of bondage, out of the alcoholism, out of the drug addiction, out of the pornography problem. We're believing that God is going to shatter that in Jesus' name. He's gonna bring you out of that season so that the people after you, so that the generations after you don't have to experience the struggle that you brought into this life, that was given to you into this life. We're praying that God is gonna do that. And so he says in 1 Chronicles 22, he says, behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest. I mean, that's our desire for the generations that are coming after us, that they would be a people of rest that our sons would be sons of rest, that our daughters would be daughters of rest. And so that they would walk in that, that they could stand for justice and peace and unity today. And that's what we're doing. We're standing and and even in the midst of things that are going on in our country right now, we're standing for justice. We're standing for unity. We're standing for peace today so that our kids won't have to fight for it as hard tomorrow. One of the reasons that we're pushing for it is both that we would see the, those that have been pushed down for so long be brought up, but we're also doing it for the generations to come that they won't have to fight the same fight that we're fighting. And, and we stand for that as a church. We stand for unity. We stand for reconciliation. We stand for peace. We stand for justice. And we stand that the image of God that is in every person, no matter what color they are, would be elevated to the platform of equality in Jesus' name. We're believing that for our country. So Jesus... In Matthew 6, goes with his disciples. And and I want you to see something that happens here. So Jesus, now this is Jesus, y'all, not like some old dude. This is Jesus. In Matthew 6, he goes back to his hometown. And as he goes back to his hometown, if you look at early verses in Matthew 6, the people even doubted him. They looked at him and said, isn't that the son of the carpenter? Isn't that so-and-so's brother? And as he started to assert himself, as he started to try to do ministry, It said that faith was so little in that place because they knew where he came from. And here's something that I want some of you to grab a hold of because I feel like some of you struggle with this. Don't be shocked when you can't do ministry. Don't be shocked when you can't see change. Don't be shocked when people don't want to acknowledge what God is doing in you when you go back to your hometown. When you go back to where you used to be, don't be shocked when those people can't see what God is doing in you because they couldn't see it in Jesus either. That means you're in good company. So in Matthew 6, we see how Jesus has been performing miracles, but when he went back to his hometown, even there was a struggle there. And the Bible says, because there was so little faith in who he was. And here's what I'm trying to understand. If we're gonna raise up people of peace, that means we may have to disconnect from the things behind us to pursue the things in front of us. We're gonna have to let go of the doubt that's behind us. We're gonna have to let go of the little faith that's behind us. We're gonna have to let go of what the naysayers have behind us so that we can start going to where God is taking us in the future. And for some of you, I just believe that's a prophetic word. I believe that's what God is speaking to you right now where you're at. I'm believing right now that God is breaking names that are in your past right now that would have held you back and he's gonna give you a bright future in Jesus name. I'm believing he's releasing right now a call, a purpose, a power, a calling an anointing that is on your life to go, to be part of and to proclaim the name of Jesus and the purpose that he has for you as you move to where God is taking you. And so Mark 6, 31, this is what happens. So after a full day, a full time of of trying to perform miracles and very little could happen because of so little faith. After being in this season where they're trying to do, trying to perform, they're trying to, man, just bring the kingdom of God on earth and very little was happening. And then even in that moment, Jesus gets word from his disciples that John has been killed. What happens in verses in verse 31 is, is he says this, then because so many people were coming and going <clears throat> that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. You see, Jesus didn't say, let's try harder. Jesus didn't say, let's do more. When he saw that things were just becoming tough, things were becoming difficult, he said, you know what? Rather than working harder, let's rest more. What could happen in our lives? What could happen in our families? If the seasons that we thought we were gonna have to work harder, we started resting more. Because here's what we know. You will never work yourself into rest. 
And for some of us, we're trying and we're trying and we're trying and we're working and we're working and we're working, believing that eventually if we work hard enough, we'll have a chance to rest. Can I tell you something? Work will never be, or rest will never be found in your work. It will always be found in the quiet place where God is with you. And so we need to be looking for quiet places where we can spend time with the Lord. You see, for so many, you feel like the disciples right now. You're exhausted, right? You've been giving and giving and giving of yourself, maybe physically, maybe even emotionally, right? You've been trying to be the pillar of strength for so many. <clears throat> Voices are coming and they're going. You have all kinds of things going on and you feel neglected. You're, you've neglected even feeding yourself what you need to be able to carry on for those that are around you. You've exhausted your output with very little input, right? Even in regards to how you're navigating social justice, right? The input that you do have isn't the spirit of God. It's the news, it's riots, it's violence, it's social media. Hear me for a second. Some of you need to turn off the computer. Some of you need to get rid of the app on your phone and you you need to start spending time with the spirit of God and let him bring rest to you. Listen, there is enough in this world between people, between politics, between social media, and then people who are ignorant. There are enough people that will bring your spirit it down. My question to you is where are you going to get your spirit brought up? Are you growing to where God is? Are you finding quiet places where God gets to breathe life back into your spirit? Because you'll never work yourself into rest. You'll never convince. I've said this before so many times. It's one of my favorite quotes, right? Uh, Arguing on social media is like playing chess with a pigeon. All they're going to do is crap all over the board and strut around like they won anyways, right? Like there's no point in doing it, right? What we need to do is we need to be going for rest. We need to stand. Don't get me wrong. We need to take a position. Don't get me wrong. We need to be a voice. We need to be active. We need to do all those things on behalf of what God has called us to do. But at the end of the day, what we need to do is if we're going to do all those things, it needs to be from a position of rest where we've spent time with the Lord. And so we have to understand that we need to do all those things, but we need, and we need to be a voice. We need to stand. But here's the thing that we have to understand. If your spiritual input is lower than your worldly output, you'll never receive rest. If your spiritual input, if your time with the Lord, if your time in his word, if worship, if all of those things, if none of those things are happening for you, if your input is low, don't be shocked when you're never rested because of your output level. Because you can work and you can try and you can declare and you can be a voice and you can stand. And you can do all those things that are important. But if you're not doing it from a rested position with God, you're losing already. <clears throat> So we have to understand that we have to create people of rest. But how do we do that? We have to do that ourselves by entering a season of rest. We have to step into our own season of rest. So what happens there? Well, in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, uh, we see this from Jesus. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, right? So he says, if you come to me, if you're weary, if you're burdened, if you're exhausted, if you're hurting, if you're broken, if you're tired, he said, come to me. Hear me for a second. There's nothing a president can do to make you feel rested. There's nothing a politician can do that can make you feel rested. There is no social justice that can come on the scene that will give you rest. And there's nothing you are fighting for that if you got it, you would now feel rested. I don't know about you, but I have fought for things in my life and obtained them. And when I I obtained them, I was only focused on the next thing I needed to be fighting for. You wanna know why? Because obtaining things doesn't give you rest. God alone gives you rest. And so what you need in your life isn't more of the things of this world. And we need to be fighting for them. Don't get me wrong. What we need to do is fight from them from a position of rest, which means we need to stand for them as we stand with God. We need time with the Lord before we go fighting any other battles because he'll give us what we need to keep going. We go back to the scriptures and he says this. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find, say this word again, rest. It says, you'll find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, David could not find that rest. 
he worked for it. And, and the thing is, is, is there was elements of David that were certainly rested. I mean, he spent time with God. He, he, he was, uh, as we see in a second, he, who God was uh, to him and who he was to God. But you see, at the end of the day, David had a vision for the temple, but he couldn't be the one to build it because he was never going to be the rested one. And if we want to build something, if we want to be part of what God is building, we need to learn to be the rested ones. No matter who David was, you see, he fought battles, he waged wars, he had issues. And even in Acts 13, says this, God testified concerning David, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. God is saying, this man is a man after my own heart, but because he's never experienced the season of rest, he'll never build what he's called to build. He won't get to see that, but his sons will. And I don't know about you, but I wanna see what God has for us. We may never see the fruition of it. We may never see the highest heights or the widest widths of what God has called us to, but that's what pioneers do. We lay the groundwork for what God will ultimately do. I pray that our children and our children's children will see the ultimate fulfillment of what God called us to start building right here and right now. That's why we're taking our stake. We're putting something in the ground and saying, God, I'm building, I'm saying yes, I'm giving, I'm being a part of what you've called us to do right now. And so we come to God, but the thing is you may fight some battles, you may wage some wars and you may have some issues, but you are still connected to God. And so how do we stay connected to God? How do we start to do that? And what does it look like to build? Well, if we're going to raise people of rest, as in the generations after us, we're going to have to go to our season of rest, which means we're going to have to build a place of rest. We're going to have to build a place of rest, not just rest for us, not just rest for our kids, but also rest for our city, rest for our families, rest for our friends, rest for the generations that come after us. Through the power of God, let's build a place where white and black and brown, where Hispanic and Asian, where every person that walks through the door gets to call a place home. Let's build a house where people don't have to check who they are at the door, but they get to walk in the door and continue to be who God has called them to be. Let's continue to build this house so that regardless of their skin color, they get to call this place home, where they don't have to assimilate, where they don't have to transform, where they don't have to take their mask off and leave it in the car, where they don't have to continue to be who they think people need them to be. They get to genuinely be who they are when they walk in the door. Whatever they look like, they get to showcase who God has created them to be and be that when they walk in the door. Let's build that house. Let's build a place where you can come in and everyone is invited, right? So TC Cope, everyone is invited. We will cultivate diversity while maintaining unity, right? Every person is invited. That's our TC code number six, right? Let's build a place where people can be celebrated, not just tolerated, right? Why? Because here at TC, celebration is not optional, right? We will celebrate every story and every person It all matters. TC code number seven. Let's build a place where people can work out their issues in a family rather than working out their issues to try to earn a spot in the family. Let's build a house where people don't have to earn their way in. Let's build a house where people get to walk in and watch God give them a spot. Watch God give them a family. Watch God give them a seat. Why? Because we're unified and unity is greater than loyalty. We will fight for each other's right to have a seat at the table. Why? Because we stick together. TC code number Number 10. In our code, we have 11 statements that defines who we are. It keeps us on track. Why? Because the world may get chaotic around us, but we're going to stand firm in who God has called us to be. And so what happens is we're building a house. So what does it, look, what does it take? What would that kind of rest even look like? What does it look like to have a house where we're known in the city for being unified, for being diverse, for being part of, it requires hard conversations. It requires necessary conversations. Sometimes we have to take a stand and guess what? We don't apologize for our stand, but we proudly say for black, for brown, for white, for every person that walks in the door, we're proud for who God has created them to be. The image of God resides in every person that walks through the door of our church and we're gonna stand unified for every single voice to matter, to count, to be heard and to be loved. Why? Because that's who God has called us to be. So we unapologetically, without reserve, stand and tell every single person we're building a house for people to meet God. Doesn't matter what they look like. Doesn't matter where they come from. We're building a house where God gets to reign. Now I'm not, so what are we talking about? We're talking about rest. 
We're talking about building something. Now I'm not talking about the rest where like, you know, the uh, gym shorts on the bean bag with Cheetos watching Netflix kind of rest, <laughs> right? Like we've been quarantined for like three months or whatever. You're over that kind of rest, right? That quarantine 15, <laughs> those 15 pounds are real that you picked up over the last three months, right? But as we've been navigating through this time, that's not the rest I'm talking about. I think we're, we could all agree we're tired of that rest. We're talking about a rest that is here. We're talking about a rest that takes over here. We're talking about a rest that can only come from God. We're talking about the rest that comes from being connected to something bigger than you, bigger than your day-to-day mundane life, bigger than uh, your next monetary goal, rest that is found only in the pursuit after God himself and the purpose that he has for you. So let's continue to build that place. What is that place even gonna look like? Number one, it's gonna be where people meet God. It says this in Exodus 33, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Let's build a house where God's presence is at. Let's build a house of freedom. Second Corinthians 3, 17 says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Let's build a house of freedom where people get to celebrate, where people get to declare the freedom that is found in Jesus, where chains are broken, where bondages are removed and people get to step into who God has called them to be. Let's build a house of prayer. Isaiah 56, seven says, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the people, all the nations, every person that walks in, it's gonna be a house of prayer. Let's talk about what it looks like for every single person, even in Luke 14, where it says, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys into the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame where the attorney gets to sit next to the homeless person, where the doctor gets to sit next to the person that doesn't know where the next meal is gonna come from. Let's build a house where every person gets to walk in and meet Jesus. Let's build a house where your children and your children's children get to declare the truth of who God is, where they get to have a genuine experience, not just religion, not just having a church service, but a relationship with God where their lives are forever changed and the gospel carries them through everything that happens in their life. We're believing that we're going to build a house through the power of God and through the spirit of God, where things in this city will never be the same. And I want to invite you to be a part of it. Matter of fact, right now, I'm going to ask my team to go ahead and drop some giving links in the comments as we talk. And here's the thing I want to challenge you right now. I want you to pray about what is it that God is putting on your heart? We said that today would be the, some of you have already started giving and we celebrate with you on that. But today we're starting to build the place. Now we, <laughs> we've been building the place, so don't get me wrong. Uh, we have been tearing down walls and stages and painting and all kinds. So we've been doing a lot around here, but the goal right now is to raise 100K in 60 days, $100,000 in 60 days. We've already had thousands come in, but hear me for a second, we need your help. Now we don't do this often. We don't come in and say, hey, let's raise this amount of money. We really don't do that often. But we're believing that we're gonna take the next 60 days and bring in $100,000 so that the, the things in uh, our life, the, th- or the things in this building, the things in our ministry that we were gonna wait on, we're just gonna go ahead and pay for now, get it done with, and let's start taking territory, let's start taking ground, and let's start moving forward with vision into where God is taking us. And so we need to raise some money to do that, and we need your help. And so myself and my wife, we've already pledged one of our stimulus checks is going to the Take Your Stake Fund. Over $1,200 we're giving personally. That, I'm just telling you that so that you know we're bought in too. This isn't something I'm asking you to do, but we're not participating. We've given, and we're going to continue to give above and beyond our tithes, above and beyond our offering. We're giving to the Take Your Stake Fund because we want to build this house. And so here's what I want to ask you to do. I wanna ask you to pray. I wanna ask you right now, just ask God, God, what should I give? Maybe he's already put a number on your heart. I'm believing that some of you are gonna give above and beyond. If a hundred people gave a thousand dollars, we're there. But maybe God's putting it on your heart right now to give $2,000 or $5,000. Maybe he's putting it on your heart to write a hundred thousand dollar check right now and take care of the whole thing. I believe that God will supernaturally move on your heart. And if he does, here's the thing that I wanna encourage you, be obedient, even if it doesn't make sense. Because as you invest, God knows he can trust you with more. As you give to what God is calling you to give to, he'll trust you with more and give back to you in a greater measure. Now, I'm certainly not suggesting that every person that is watching has to give thousands of dollars. I believe that you should trust what God puts on your heart. I believe he'll speak to you if you ask him. 
And so they're putting links in the comments right now for where you can give. And if you go to our website, you can just click on the drop down menu. It says, take your stake. If you'd like to mail in a check or anything like that, when we go back to our service host, uh, Pastor Justin will give you the website and it's that information where you can uh, mail in checks if you wanna do it that way. But I encourage you, if you wanna give online, man, join us, join me and my wife, join our families, join our pastoral team, Join all of us, join our dream team, join every person here at Transformation Church and let's give together. Let's start today. What could happen over the next 60 days? Here's the question I have for you and I want you to think about this. If you're obedient right now, if you're obedient over the next 60 days, what could happen that we give over the next 60 days that would change the next 60 years? And so I want you to ask yourself that question and just be obedient to whatever God puts on your heart. You can give online at transformationchurch.com. Uh, you can click the link in the comments and you can give there as well. So I wanna invite you to join us as we give today. Now, before I turn the service back over to our hosts, I do wanna pray for you because I believe there are some of you who have been listening today and you, you may give, you may not give, but you, what you're thinking about is this idea of rest. And you're thinking, and as we're preaching and as we're talking today, and even as worship was going, that really hits you in your spirit. Man, I need rest, like chaos around me, just all the noise, I need rest. And I, I wanna pray right now that God would give you that rest. So God, I just pray for every person that can hear me today, every person that's watching, even every person that's in this room, God. God, chaos drama, riots, violence, whether it's good, whether it's bad, God has consumed the airwaves, both on social media, but also the airwaves in our hearts and our minds and on our spirits. So God, I pray right now that you would bring perfect peace and rest into the hearts of people. God, those who have been worked up, God, those who have had sleepless nights, God, I pray for those who, whose hearts have been heavy and their minds have been occupied, that God, you would come in and bring supernatural peace in their heart, that rest would be so abundant. God, I pray for sleeping nights. I pray for rested mornings, God. I pray, Lord, that they would find themselves being rejuvenated through the power of God and through your spirit. So I pray right now that the peace of God that passes all of our understanding, God, would swoop into our hearts, into our minds, and into our spirits. So God, those who have had their head low and heavy, God, I pray that you be the lifter of our heads. God, those whose spirit has been drawn down, God, I pray that you lift our spirits and we would find shelter under the wing of the almighty God who created the universe. So we come to you and we say, thank you. Lift us up in Jesus name. And, and with one last prayer, if you're watching this today, you say, I need that rest, I need that peace, but more importantly, I just need God. Today, if you don't know God, but you want to, and you need him in your life, I wanna pray with you today because God is ready to meet you in a special way. You see, our sin separates us from God. But when Jesus died on the cross and he rose again three days later, he paid for our sins so that we could know God. And today, if you wanna know him, it's a very simple process. It wasn't easy because it cost Jesus his life, but it's simple because it'll cost you the rest of yours. And here's a process that you have to do. Repent of your sins. That means turn away, never to go back. But then he says, put your faith in him. In other words, all you have to do is believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead and that he paid for your sins. That faith alone will make you saved. And today, if you want to put words to that action, in other words, if you're believing, you say, Jesus, I'm putting my faith in you that you paid for my sins and I'm gonna live for you. I'm giving you my life. If that's you today, I wanna lead you in this prayer. And this prayer doesn't make you saved. This prayer puts words to the actions of your heart that says, God, I'm giving you my life. And so I wanna invite you to repeat this prayer after me as we declare that Jesus is the ruler of our life. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me my sins. Forgive me my wrongs. Make me clean. Make me pure. Make me whole. I believe in you. I believe you died for me. I believe you paid for my sins. And I believe you resurrected three days later through your life, through your death, and through your resurrection, I can be saved. So I give you my life. Make me brand new. 
In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, listen, we are celebrating with you right here at Transformation Church. We're so honored. And uh, before we send it back to our service host, I want to let you know our team is putting links in the comments right now to a Connect card. And we would love it if you'd fill that Connect card out, either if you're new or if you prayed that prayer today and Jesus is giving you a brand new life. Either one of those, if you'll fill out that Connect card for us, that'll help us help you take the next steps that God has for you. So we're so honored. So as you give today to the Take Your Stake, as you give today, let's build a place where the people after us can enter into a season of rest because we're gonna enter into a season of rest as we build a place of rest where God is going to reign in our city.